Our second speaker for today, uh, Stefan Blomhoeve. Uh, Stefan is a PhD candidate at the Hieronymus Academy of Data Science in Zuid-Belgen Bos, where he started working after obtaining his master's degree uh, from Tilburg University in the domain of data science. His master's thesis, in fact, uh, has been making since his master thesis. In fact, he has been making use of complex networks uh, to model multi-dimensional multi data, such as relational or temporal data collected from sensor networks. These models can be useful, for example, when uh, monitoring strain and vibration of a bridge, but also when participants of a large event are being tracked to detect when and where information hubs are being formed and how information is exchanged. This can also be an informal event, as Stefan could attest to, because his very first project, project in this area concerned student parties. Stefan, we're very much looking forward to your talk today. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, also, uh, thank you, Indeed, for organizing this type of talk. I really enthusiastic it to be uh, to uh, share my work with you all. So there we go. So indeed, uh, my name is David Blumenhoffel, PhD candidate at Tilburg University and also located at the uh, Euronymous Academy for Data Science in uh, Den Bosch. I'm going to talk today about time series analysis with help of wrong known networks. So a small overview of the talk. So first I'll explain uh, uh, what Euclidean data and non-Euclidean data uh, mean. Uh, and also the, uh, give an introduction about the data structure for the graphs. Then I'll give a small introduction to earthquakes and seismic data because that is the domain that I'm working on. And then tell you about the latest work uh, uh, that I performed, which is called time series analysis with graph model networks. So, as you're all familiar with, uh, deep learning uh, and all the efforts in deep learning have shown great success in mining patterns. Uh, on, uh, and, and several data related topics. And most of these successes are visible in data that contains a sort of grid like structure, perfect grid structure, and also a system of coordinates to work on. Well, what does that mean? Actually, as we're all familiar with sound or uh, images, this follows a sort of structure. So uh, on the left, you see a time series, which is, for example, uh, some sound wave. And this is ordered in a chronological manner, and every moment in time is one step ahead and one step uh, behind the other point in time. And if you look at an image, an image is a sort of 2D grid where all the pixels are nicely organized. So this is the notion of like euclidean -ness. But what if we have data that does not really follow this pattern? Well, uh, non-Euclidean data can be, for example, a road network uh, or a molecule data set. So a road network, uh, consists of all these specific roads that are connected to each other. And you can imagine that the roads in Amsterdam or in Tilburg are much more densely connected than roads in other parts of the Netherlands. And if you would look at the molecules, it's a figure on the right, uh, these are connected by all these different atoms, and they can have different connections between them, and that completely, completely changes the molecule. So this, of course, doesn't really follow some sort of structure. So how do you learn on this kind of data? So what researchers have done is represent this kind of information with a graph. And this is a sort of data structure. And uh, it's also visualized here in this figure. And it consists of nodes, which are the, the dots that you see, and also the edges. And that are the gray lines between the, uh, the dots. So on the left, you see uh, the, that the nodes are numbered. So node 5 and node 6 are connected to each other. And this, um, uh, again, this can be a road network, which I've shown. But it could also be a specific type of model. But there's this issue, because we're going to talk about learning on this kind of data. Uh, the issue is that this, this, this data is so different from these images or sound data that we need some different techniques to learn on it. And here you see um, a small example of how a typical convolutional neural network would do such a task on an image. I'll explain it briefly for those of you that are not familiar. Um, you see a toy robot image on the left and a small gray box. And 
What the image is trying to explain is that it will slide across this image and generate features from it to eventually funnel the data into an other yeah, representation so we can learn from it. And the output would, for example, be, uh, hey, this is a toy or this is a robot. But there are some challenges in yeah, doing this technique on a graph because, yeah, if we look at these molecules again, they all have uh, different kind of atoms and they have different kind of connections. And also, these connections can have different strengths. So there's this lack of consistency in the data. And if you would look at data sets of images, uh, you will find that most of them have all the same dimensionality in the sense of that all the pictures have a 500 by 500 pixel width. So here, this would not hold. And another issue is that these data sets or graphs often have nodes and edge level features or kind of information that you might want to include as well in your analysis. So imagine that this is again this figure, but now it's a, it's a network of cities. City one could be Den Bosch and city two could be Tilburg. If you would want to calculate the estimated time of arrival, if you want to drive there, you would know the distance between the cities. It would also be interesting to know what, that there's a traffic jam ahead. And it's a five kilometers of length. So you want to incorporate that information. But if this was a social network, uh, you can see it on the right side of the image a bit. I've drawn a little person there. Um, if you want to learn from a social network kind of data set, you would want to know how many friends he has, uh, how long he is on this network. So, for example, his account age is eight years old, and his age is 22. So, how do you include this information as well? So, this general question. That has been uh, yeah, struck with researchers for the, the last couple of years is how can we translate this convolution procedure, that's this sliding a window over this image, for example, uh, over to graphs, because that does not work. Well, it's actually uh, pretty intuitive and elegant, uh, and it helps by thinking of the graph in a different manner. And uh, we therefore represent the graph in a JC matrix, which represents the nodes in the network. And here we see the JC matrix that is also. Uh, visible of this figure on the right. So it consists of four nodes. And how you read this, these matrices is there's a one that there's a connection between two, between two nodes and a zero if there's not. So if I highlight the fourth node, which is the last row, and there you can see there's no connection with node one. Okay, that's clear. There are two, two ones uh, after each other. These represent the connections with node two and three. And there's no connection with itself. So there's a zero as well. Okay, so now we have uh, this representation of the graph. What can we do then? Well, it turns out that if you uh, multiply that adjacent matrix with a feature matrix, and these features are just pieces of information about the node. So that could be uh, the number of friends you have in a social network or um, your account age. Uh, if you do a multiplication with uh, the adjacent matrix and this feature matrix, you actually get a new representation that is just the sum of the neighboring features. So, okay, what can we do with that information? Well, I'll first explain uh, how this uh, again works. So I've highlighted uh, node four, and it is connected with node two and three. They, they have these features, one, one, two, two, and these get summed together. So this new uh, representation of this node will be one plus one plus two, and two plus two is four. And again, if you do this for the node two in the graph, there's a bit more connections. There's a connection with all other nodes in the graph. Now it's summed together to three and six. So thus, a convolution on the graph can be thought of as a sort of message possible. You, you give each other information about yourself, and then you can learn from that. So then, OK, this is like the building uh, block of this model. Uh, then uh, there is this uh, really interesting paper of Thomas Keith and Mont Wedding that made this all a lot better with their graph convolutional networks. And it's a really popular paper in this field. Uh, they've included self loops into the JC matrix because it's also important to uh, include your own features. And also some normalization tricks are applied because if the node has a lot of features, their sum would be really high, of course, you don't want that, but these do some uh, instabilities in training. This is not the only model that uh, is apparent. There are many others. So diffusion convolution, edge convolution, uh, gravitation networks, you can name it. Um, they're all uh, implemented in the spectral package, all based on chaos and TensorFlow, if you're interested. So what kind of tasks can you do with these graph neural network models? You can do node classification. So let's see that we have this uh, network of movie enthusiastic, enthusiastic people. And you know that the green ones, they like trailer movies. And the orange colored uh, nodes, they like uh, rom-coms. 
given that two new people join this network and start making friends, could we maybe predict what would be their favorite genre? Or you can do something uh, with the entire graph itself. You could classify the entire label of the graph. Given again this Monkey example, maybe we know from uh, our training data that uh, uh, some of them are toxic and some of them are not. Could we maybe predict from the structure in this network and the atoms that are in there if it's also a toxic molecule? And lastly, another type of uh, analysis that can be performed is that you can predict a link in the network given attributes of other nodes on the graph and what kind of example, uh, example connections there already are. So perhaps these two people, node four and three, should be uh, brought together. And this is exactly what Twitter or LinkedIn do to uh, uh, give you recommendations for friends. So this was a small introduction into uh, graph magnetic research. Now I'll talk a bit more about what kind of uh, uh, research I'm doing with these techniques. And this is uh, applied on earthquake data. Yeah? And earthquakes are actually a really great candidate for doing a graph magnetic research because yeah, there's an enormous amount of data already gathered at these seismological stations for over like 50 or 60 years. And these sensors are geographically grounded. So we know the latitude and longitude information. The data is recorded by sensors and it's really crucial for seismologists. So they use this data all the time to say something about earthquakes that occur. And a typical use cases are determining the epicenter of, a, of a, an earthquake and also estimating the magnitude of one. And it can be used for early warning. And that is exactly what I did. So to give an earthquake early warning, you have to look at this earthquake data. And uh, earthquakes actually give a lot of hints about themselves. So they send out different waves when it occurs. So in this picture on the left, you see that uh, a fault is occurring, there's an earthquake happening, and it shoots these waves into the ground. There are some lighter B waves, but also more slower later on, S waves and surface waves, which are way more damaging. So if we can take hints from this P wave, we could perhaps predict how intense these F wave, S waves will get. So that's exactly what they do, by placing all these sensors in areas where there is a high chance of an earthquake occurring. And then we can notify people. So how does this look like in a more schematic uh, view? So on the left, we see a red star. And it is, uh, this is this earthquake epicenter. And it starts to show its waves to the nearby stations. Uh, these waves are visualized in the middle of the figure. So you see some of them uh, see it very soon. But most of them see the initial the rumbling way later. And the task of early warning uh, is that you look at the uh, initial seconds of this uh, data set. So we have 20, 25 seconds of data, but we only look at the first 10 seconds to say something about what happens in the later on periods of the earthquake. And uh, what we're trying to do is do a regression task because we want to say something about how intense this earthquake is measured at all the stations in our network. So we uh, perform a regression task to predict five numbers which characterize the earthquake. And why is this important? Well, a few things. So uh, there's, of course, uh, public warnings that we can give to people to find shelter, but also first order mobilization. So we can already open fire station doors for rapid deployment of fire trucks. We can uh, notify hospitals. So in the healthcare, we can stop medical procedures for people that are undergoing surgery. And in mass transit systems, we can prevent trains from uh, colliding or derailing by the shaking of the earthquake, and also we can clear bridges of vehicles. So that brings us to my paper, which I recently uh, submitted. Could we make use of the spatial information of the sensors to perform uh, a, a regression analysis and improve predictions? And that is uh, exactly what we did. So we made a new paper, graph neural networks for multivariate time series regression with application to seismic data. And what is really cool is that I've worked together with two actual seismologists from Italy. So it's a really close uh, cross domain collaboration, also an international collaboration, which I always find really interesting. So by modeling the uh, stations in a seismic uh, network as nodes in a graph, we can apply uh, graph neural networks on the signal data. And uh, you can see them right here. Uh, we use two data sets, two that are completely different from each other. So on the left side, you see network one, where it's a really densely connected region, and also the earthquakes shown as orange dots are really kind of densely connected. On the right, you see another network, also in Italy, which is it covers a larger land area, and also the earthquakes are more scattered around. So it's a bit of a tougher use case. 
we made a model uh, which is really uh, unique actually that first uses uh, standard convolutional neural networks to uh, generate features from this earthquake data and then uh, the main premise of our paper is that we show that you can actually use the output of the CNN layers as input in a graph neural network uh, layer by reshaping the size of this uh, convolutional network and then eventually you can use it for certain tasks we did a regression task but you, you can also apply it for uh, classification for example so concerning the results we compared our model against the CNN baseline that was uh, created by the uh, seismological experts from Italy uh, and also other traditional machine learning algorithms, so k nearest neighbor, HG boost, random forest. And we saw great results. So we had an average mean spread error reduction of 17.9% on uh, both data sets compared to the best performing baseline for the CNN. And uh, this is actually really remarkable because keep in mind that the only information that we've added was the notion of this graph. Uh, uh, so this is only one time calculated before you do the analysis uh, at all. So with a little bit of effort, you get a really great reduction in error. And even uh, more interesting, of course, uh, we're trying to give early warnings. The earlier warning, the better. And we tried uh, reducing this input window length to see how yeah, far we can go. And it turned out that we can halve the input uh, window length of our graph neural network model while still achieving similar performance to the baseline CNN. And uh, I hope you can see it on the figure on the right. You can see that we have this, such a head start that even with five seconds of data, 50% of the data, we can uh, similarly score uh, compared to the CNN. So this is really crucial since we're trying to give off early warnings. So in conclusion, we've shown that graph neural networks excel at learning uh, from features that have a spatial grounding. And uh, from our paper, we have seen that graph neural networks can learn from these sequential time series features uh, generated by CNN. So that is really uh, crucial. For future work, we want to uh, investigate the scalability of our model to sensor networks that are of uh, even larger size. Now we investigated uh, 39 uh, stations in both of these networks. We are interested to see what happens when we increase this number to 200 or even 500 nodes. And also we want to try transfer learning techniques. So perhaps we can train on one network and then transfer some of this knowledge onto another network so we don't have to retrain all the time. That would be a really good value for the seismological community that told us. So uh, thank you for watching and uh, if there are any questions, let me know. Thank you, Stefan, for a very interesting talk and for a nice introduction into the domain, which we appreciate it. I have a question about potential implementation of your research uh, results. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know that uh, these techniques uh, can be quite uh, time consuming in the um, phase of training and uh, that they can be quite demanding also when they're implemented. Now this concerns an early warning system. How does that work in practice? Um, well, eventually, well, what our works in practice is that you continuously monitor the data that's generated by these sensor networks. And uh, you could uh, supply this data in batches to the uh, neural network uh, to make a prediction. And uh, luckily, uh, we also saw that the, the, the model size of the graph neural network is also even smaller than the original uh, convolutional neural network. So you can actually run it on fairly simple computers to make, uh, make these predictions. So that's how, how uh, normally this works. We give them badges. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. And the second question that I would like to ask is about the transfer learning. So can you imagine that the results that you obtain for this particular data set could be actually uh, used, the, the pre-trained uh, model could be used also in other domains that might have similar properties? Uh, yes, I think so as well. Um, what you could, for example, do is test it on weather data. So um, weather data uh, also has kind of different uh, characteristics. It has a somewhat um, short-term pattern. So in a day, the temperature changes really uh, a lot. But the course of a season, there's this longer pattern. So I hope that the graph neural network can actually uh, launch that as well. Uh, but all the kind of domains that are actually you, uh, are using these techniques is uh, predicting uh, traffic networks, uh, on, uh, predicting the estimated time of arrival. So I know that uh, Google implements this in Google Maps. Uh, so given the speed data of all these uh, people that are driving around on roads, would you make uh, predictions better? You could also use techniques here. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Th
So uh, a lot of companies and also our researchers are finding out new domains where these techniques can be used. So let's hope uh, we see some other creative techniques as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank <music> you.